Well, good morning to all of you. Uh, so glad to see you. Uh, Sandy and I, of course, Mary Andrea and Mandy are glad to be with you. Uh, we've been planning this trip for quite a long time. And fortunately, the elders who are preaching were gracious enough to give us six weeks to come on this trip, and that's not normal. Um, you know, when Alan Borak and some of the others come, they come for two or three weeks. Um, but I said to them, you know, I haven't seen these people for a long time, and I may never see them again. Uh, and it's a long way to go for just two weeks or three weeks, so let me go for two months. And one of the elders said, um, well, how about a month? <laughs> and so we eventually compromised on six weeks. And so I'm happy for us to be here. But I'm also happy to see all of you. And I'm happy to see those that we didn't know before that are new to us, but not new to you. I'm happy to see those who are remaining faithful to the Lord. It's nice to see that the young people have been growing up and have become young men and young women and participating uh, in the work of the Lord. And that's just a wonderful thing. I also want to say in the beginning that the song that was chosen, 597, Let the Beauty of Jesus Be Seen in You, is very appropriate to my lesson this morning. Uh, it was not planned. The professor didn't ask me what I was speaking about. I didn't tell him. I didn't ask what he was singing about. And he didn't tell me. But these two things fit together very well. But I was reminded when I was um, thinking about the lesson sitting there in the seat and how things have changed. COVID changed us and the way we do things. All over the world, people are doing things differently than they did before COVID. But COVID is not the only thing that has changed. We have allowed the events of our lives to change us. If we're Christians, we should be allowing the gospel to change us. And in fact, we should be continually in a process of change. Not change for change's sake, but change because for a better sake, for the Lord's sake. Because as we have sung, as Professor has reminded us this morning in the Bible class, that what we are doing, we ought to be doing for the glory of God. It's not for our glory. We are nothing. In fact, the Bible describes us as worms uh, in comparison to God. We're talking about the living God, the only living God. We're talking about the one who created us. We're talking about the one who saved us from our sins and who has offered salvation to all men, irrespective of what they have done in life or what they are doing in life. God has granted us the privilege of coming to Him. In the reading this morning, you may have noticed that towards the end of the reading, uh, Jesus speaks about His death. And the way he reminds us, or reminded the disciples, that he was going to be put to death. And in fact, he says this several times, particularly in the book of John. And we're, we're sometimes just like those people were, because we're human, and they were human. Is We sometimes don't get the message. And they didn't get the message. They were only getting the message after the resurrection of Jesus and then their lives were completely transformed. But he says to the disciples in verses 32 and 33, If I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And verse 33 says that he said this speaking about or signifying of what kind of death he would die. So that's what I want us to think about this morning, is lifting up the Lord. Um, when he was speaking about, if I be lifted up, he wasn't saying, maybe this is going to happen, maybe I'm going to get out of it. He knew 
that he was going to die. That's because that's what God, he and God had planned in the, from the beginning of time. Because God knew that when he created Adam and Eve, that they would sin and he would have to provide a way of salvation to them. And this is the way of salvation that he provided. And this is a beginning step. Well, maybe I shouldn't say it's a beginning step, it's close to the end of the end step. Because this is in the last week of the life of Jesus. And he knows that the time of his death is at hand. And so repeatedly in these last chapters of the book of John, he will tell them, I'm going to die. I'm going, we're going to Jerusalem. And I'm going to be delivered to the Jews. And I'm going to die. But I'm going to be resurrected. And it still didn't penetrate. They were slow of hearing, and sometimes we are slow of hearing. So let's hear what the Lord has to say. There are actually three events in the Bible that relate to this idea about lifting up, if I am lifted up. And the first one, of course, is that he has been lifted up on the cross. Now, he didn't say that in this passage, but... Uh, Sorry, I, I never preach from my, my, uh, I never speak from this machine, and so I may have a problem today, but anyway, we'll do the best we can. Um, what the scripture does tell us though is that Jesus was lifted up on the cross. And one of the things that we sometimes forget is who did this? Who lifted him up on the cross? Well, a short answer would be the Jewish people. But in reality, it was they condemned him to death. That's what the scripture tells us. They condemned him, but they were not the ones who put him actually to death. That was done by the Gentiles. The Gentiles, of course, were the people who were in control of the Jewish people at that time. In the book of, of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 18 to 20, Jesus says this, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. This is, of course, Matthew's record of the period of time drawing close to his death. We are going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the scribes. And that's the religious leaders of the day. And they will, be, they will condemn him to death. And they will deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And of course, many times when we take the Lord's Supper, that's a, those are the kinds of things that we remember that he was betrayed by one of his own friends. He was betrayed by his own people. He was betrayed by those who should have known better, the religious leaders, because they were very conversant with the Old Covenant and what the Old Covenant taught about the coming of the Messiah. And they would deliver him to the Gentiles because the Gentiles were the ones who had the power to kill him. The Jews did not have that authority. But what is sometimes something that we don't remember or may not know is that this was not their doing. Oh, they executed the plan, but the plan was not theirs. The plan was God's. And that was from the beginning of time. Before the foundation of the world, God had predetermined that this was going to happen. And so when Peter was preaching the first sermon, the first gospel sermon after the death of Christ, to the, that throng of people, Jewish people that were in Jerusalem. They were there by the thousands. I read this morning that the, the population of Jerusalem is estimated to have been about 70,000 people uh, at the time of Jesus. But the population at this time of the year in the book of Acts chapter 2 was something like 185,000 people. Because Jews had come from all over the world to worship 
and to keep the Passover and Pentecost. And Acts chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost and most of us are well aware of what happened then, that the apostles were promised that they would receive the gift or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they did. And they began to speak in other languages. And there were about 15 different languages represented there. Although these people were Jews mostly, or Jewish proselytes, they, their mother tongue amongst many of them was Italian, or it was some of the Galatian dialect, or even the, the Persian dialect, and so on. They, they all spoke different languages, although they may have spoke, spoken Hebrew or Greek because Greek was the national language, just like English is now. And so, uh, when Peter stood up to, to speak, and he was telling them that they had put to death the Son of God, he says in verse 23 in chapter 2, he was delivered by the determined purpose and, and foreknowledge of God, and you have taken him and have crucified him and put him to death. But it was God who made that decision. It was God who planned and purposed that these people, the Jews, the Gentiles, would be involved in the condemnation of Jesus and the putting of him to death. But actually, it was God who had done this. That was his plan and that was his purpose. And incidentally, that was so that we could be saved. That was a part of God's essential plan of salvation that he was willing to carry out no matter what the cost was to him or to his son. He valued you and me so much that he was quite willing to give his son to die for us. Later on when uh, Peter and John in Acts chapter 4 uh, of arrested and then tried by the Jewish council and then let go after being beaten, they go back to the other disciples that they were with. And when the disciples hear what happened to them, they begin to praise and magnify God. And this is part of their prayer. For truly, this is Acts chapter 4 verse 27, for truly against your holy servant Jesus who you anointed, Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, the people of God were gathered together. And of course that's an Old Testament prophecy that the people, the nations would be gathered together against God's anointing and put him to death. To do, verse 28 says, to do whatever your hand, that's God's hand, has and your purpose determined to be done beforehand. So it was God who purposed this, and God who brought about this plan. Even though the enemies of God lifted him up, it was God who planned that and brought that about. And actually, Jesus being lifted up is essential to the salvation of God's people. That's part of God's plan. But there's another way in which he was lifted up. Although the, word lift, the words lifted up are not used in relation to this uh, portion of the lesson, what's used is he was raised up or he was resurrected. We're talking about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. God raised him up. And incidentally, in this portion of the lesson, nobody else had anything to do with this. The enemies of Jesus were very much involved in his death, but they had nothing to do with his resurrection. That was all God's plan. That was all God, Jesus' purpose and his operation. Um, in verse 24 of Acts chapter 2, that's one of the central messages that Peter is preaching, is that you crucified the Son of God, but God raised him up. And he proceeds to show them that this is what their scriptures had been telling them. You know, sometimes, I, personally, I'm astounded at how ignorant we are, or how easy we forget, 
But we were just like them. I mean, these were people who read the law. These people that had come from all over the known world to worship, these people were dedicated to what they believed in, to the scriptures that they read. And in fact, when Paul is out preaching later on, he will mention this fact to them, that these scriptures are read every Sabbath, not just occasionally, but every Sabbath in your synagogue. And yet it's so easy for us to forget the significance and the importance of what was being said. And so he says to them, you killed him, but God raised him up from the dead. That's what David said in Psalm 16. And he quotes from Psalm 16. God raised him up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by the grave or by death. And so Jesus was in the grave for three days, yes. But his, soul, his body did not see corruption. God raised him to a new level. In Acts chapter 2, verses 30 and 32, at, towards the end of the recorded sermon that Peter preached, he says that David, being a prophet, and knowing, in verse 30, that God would, had sworn with an oath that of the fruit of his loins, that is, one of his descendants, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, and his flesh did not see corruption. This Jesus, God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, which we now see and hear, which He's poured out, and you now see and hear, He's telling those people. But did you notice, several times here, He's using the term raised up. God raised Him up from the grave, because that was not the plan, that He should just rot in the grave like our bodies would do over a period of time. He would not be like that. This was still God's plan. And God brought that about. But it's also a plan that was essential to the salvation of your soul and my soul. The third thing, uh, another thing about this, when Jesus was raised from the dead, the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 26 will say these words, that the Christ would suffer and that he would be the first to rise from the dead. That term that he would be the first to rise from the dead needs to be understood in the overall context of the Bible. He's not the first to rise physically from the dead. There were several people in the time of Jesus that actually Jesus raised up from the dead. There were several people that are mentioned in the Old Testament who died and were raised up from the dead. But every single one of those people would die again and would be buried and their bodies would turn to dust just like everybody else. But Jesus is the first in the sense that he's the one who rose from the dead but will never die again. I can still remember when I first latched onto or first thought I understood that the meaning of what that meant. That he's still living now, 2,000 years later. All religious, all people, it doesn't matter what their religion is, even if they are the great leaders of a particular religious movement, they're all dead. And they're not rising again until the end day. And they'll be raised either to glory or they'll be raised to eternal condemnation. Just like the rest of us. But not Jesus. That was God's plan. And it was that, that giving him eternal life that gives you and I the hope of having eternal life. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians, he tells them that God gave him 
the, that he lives by the power of God, and we also are weak, but we shall also live with him by the power of God. And in Romans chapter 1 and verse 4, the Apostle Paul declares that Jesus is the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. So there were many good reasons why Jesus needed to be raised up and God raised him up from the dead and gave him life again. But as Peter pointed out, he didn't stay here raised from the dead. What God did was he raised him up into heaven. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in the Bible class, but in Acts chapter 1, that's the scene that we see. Jesus standing with his disciples and he goes up into heaven and they're watching him go. And he's going there to sit at the right hand of God. The Apostle Peter, years later, will preach the same message that he's been preaching from Acts chapter 2. That he has ascended into heaven, that he sits at the right hand of God, and he rules and reigns in the affairs of men. When in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 22, he says, talking about Jesus, that he has gone up into heaven, and he's at the right hand of God, and angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. He's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You remember the verses that we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 30 to 33? Peter was saying that same message then that he said years and years later. One thing I didn't mention earlier, but the, the, word, the words lifted up are both used literally and figuratively. It literally means that they put him on the cross. It literally means that God raised him up and God took him into heaven. But another meaning of that, those words, is that he was exalted. And that's what God designed. God designed that in his cruel, shameful, painful death, he would be exalted. In his resurrection from the dead, he would be exalted. In his ascension to heaven, he would be exalted. But there's a third, there's a fourth lifting up that I want us to think about for a few minutes this morning. And it relates to you and me. And we are to lift him up. I don't know if you recognized or realized when we took the Lord's Supper. Actually, that's what we were doing. We were lifting up the Jesus. We were proclaiming his death until he comes. And so anybody and everybody that would see us coming and know that we're taking the Lord's Supper, even though they may not understand what the implications of that is, to us, that should be clear, that we are proclaiming the Lord's death. And we cannot be saved without the Lord's death. Just like we can't be saved without His resurrection, and we can't be saved without His ascension. And so God had made this plan, and we are actually complying with that when we take the Lord's Supper. We are remembering His death. We are remembering His sacrifice. We are remembering His love for us. We are remembering that He gave everything for us. And that's what we're doing each week. And that's why assembling is so important. Is so that we can remember. Because it's so easy for us to forget. I'll never forget the first time that I was sick for several weeks. We were in America and I got a, some kind of a virus or something and I didn't go to worship for three weeks because I was sick. And I remember sitting one Sunday and thinking, you yeah, know, two days in the week now I have off. <laughs> because normally people tell me, I work five or six days a week and Sunday is the only day I have off. And they don't want to spend it worshiping, they want to spend it pleasuring. 
And I thought, well, that's one of the reasons why. And I began to understand how some people may feel. But that doesn't excuse us from worshipping God. And when I'm not worshipping God as He planned, I'm not acknowledging Him. Actually, I'm not lifting Him. So, let's just think about how we lift Him up. We lift Him up in the Lord's Supper. How do we exalt Him in other aspects of our life? I believe we lift Him up through preaching and teaching. And in fact, whether I recognize it or not, or whether any speaker or teacher recognizes it or not, when you speak about Jesus Christ, when you speak about the Gospel and the things of, of God, that's what you're doing. You're lifting up, you're, you're pointing people's attention, and you're raising their expectation and their attention towards something higher than yourself. But the fact of the matter is that we're all teachers. We may ignore this fact. We may not recognize this fact because, oh, I don't know how to preach or I don't know how to teach is an excuse that sometimes we use. But we are all teaching. As a father and a mother, you've taught your children how to behave. You've taught your children what's right and wrong or you're teaching them what's right and wrong. You teach them many things. And in fact, as they watch you, they learn from you, what you think is important or not important. And that's the lesson, those are the most powerful lessons that they carry through the rest of their life. And so, how am I exalting the Lord in my life as a teacher? I say we're all teachers because when, Peter, when Jesus was giving the Great Commission, he told the apostles to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and he that believes and is baptized will be saved, and he that doesn't believe will be condemned. In Matthew's record, he also says, Teach them to command, I command you to teach them all of my commandments. So, if I was the apostle Paul and I'm teaching you, I'm supposed to teach you how to teach somebody else. That's part of the process. And then you will go and teach somebody else, and you'll teach them the process, part of the process to teach other people. That's always how the gospel has been propagated throughout time. And, and when you read the book of Acts, it's just an incredible growth pattern of the, of the gospel. But it was started by 12 men. Those 12 men you hear very little about. But who do you hear about? You hear about Barnabas, and you hear about Aristarchus, and you hear about Titus and Timothy and other men that were converted by Paul and other preachers, that were converted by other apostles, men and women, who wherever they went, they took the gospel with them and they preached the gospel, and the gospel spread through them. That's what Acts chapter 8 verse 5 says. They went everywhere. When Saul of Tarsus was killing them and putting them in prison and making them blaspheme, they ran away from Jerusalem and they took the gospel with them. They went everywhere preaching the gospel. That's because that's our responsibility as individual Christians. And there are certain ways that we can do this. You know, when, uh, when Paul was writing to the Galatian church, uh, as you may know from your own study of the book of Galatians, the Galatians had a problem uh, that so many people had. Because many people come out of a religion that they believe in or their forefathers had believed in. And sometimes it's difficult to give that up. But even if you haven't come from a religious background and you become a Christian, you've given up something that was important to you before. And of course that was the problem with the Galatians. And Paul writes to them in chapter 3 and verse 1 and he says to them, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not believe the truth? And notice that. He said, you've been bewitched. 
Your mind has been changed and you are, what you're doing now is not the truth. If we go back into the first and second chapter, you'll see that Paul is very clear that the message that he preached to them was not his message. It came from the Lord. The Lord gave him the revelation and he was proclaiming what the Lord said. That is the truth. But now, somebody had come to them and given them another gospel as he calls it in chapter 1 which he says is not another gospel but it's actually a perversion of the true gospel so he says you've been bewitched and you don't belong you don't believe the truth anymore what they were doing then is practicing and believing something different he says although Jesus Christ was portrayed clearly to you. In other words, when I taught you the truth, I was presenting Jesus as he is and what he is. But now you've changed. So what was he telling them? He was telling them, you're actually not lifting up the Lord. You're lifting up this mosaic doctrine that you gave up when you became Christian. He'll also tell these Galatians that when they went to a different doctrine, when they believed something that was not written in the scriptures, then they had fallen from the grace of God. They were out of relationship with God. The only thing that kept them in a relationship with God and the only thing that keeps you and I in a relationship with God is the gospel. And yet so often it's so easy to forget and to ignore and one of the reasons we forget and ignore is because it makes demands on us. Is that time up? Now he said I could preach until midnight. <laughs> so incidentally, the uh, professor is going to provide lunch at our lunch break and supper at our supper break. <laughs> um, so they were not lifting up Jesus when they turned back to the law. They were lifting up the law of Moses. And Jesus had been downgraded to, as, uh, to an insignificant position. But Jesus can only be lifted up when we follow the scriptures. And that's one of the things that Paul is telling the Galatians. And as I mentioned, he, he's lifted up in the Lord's Supper. And in fact, when you think about a larger picture, Jesus is lifted up in the way we live. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, uh, Paul talks to the, to the Ephesian people and what he reminds them in some of the first up to the verse 20 is that they were people of the world. They were like the Gentiles. They did the Gentile thing. They, they acted, they were fornicators, they were adulterers, they were idolaters, they were liars, they were cheats, they were thieves. Whatever it, it was that they were, that was what their life was before. And one of the things he says to them, particularly in verse 20, I want to emphasize, you did not learn that from Jesus Christ. Just stop and think about that for a minute. The way you live, the way I live, did we learn that from Jesus or did we learn it from something else or somewhere? I'm not asking you to answer me. I'm asking you to answer yourself and to answer the Lord. But he goes on to say, um, did you learn this from Jesus? Or, or you didn't learn this from Jesus? Indeed, you have heard, verse 21, of him, and you have been taught about him as the truth is in Jesus. Remember Paul said to the Galatians, you've denied the truth, I spoke the truth to you, you've denied it. Now he's repeating that statement to the Ephesians that the truth is in Jesus Christ, or about him, or in him. That you put off your former conversation. One of the hardest things in the world, I think, is to put off what we had believed and held to so closely before we became Christian. But that's what we have to do. That's what he's saying. Put it off. Take it off. 
and put on instead by being renewed in your mind. You know that that's what repentance is. When I change my mind about Jesus, that he's no longer just another man walking around on earth doing all these fancy things and saying all these fancy things, that he is really the Son of God, that he is really my Saviour, that he's really my Creator, that he's really the risen Saviour, and that my salvation depends on how I react and relate to him in this life. When I really begin to understand that, then my mind has been renewed. I'm, I've repented of what I was, and I'm now willing to walk in another way that will reveal him and raise him up. When, again, when Paul was talking to the Galatians, uh, you may remember in Galatians chapter 5, he talks about them walking in the Spirit and living in the Spirit and bearing the fruits of the Spirit. And when you look at those fruits, they are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, kindness, uh, faithfulness, uh, self-control, and he says there's no law against those. You know why? Because that's exactly how Jesus lived. Jesus was loving and kind. Jesus was gentle. Oh, he could be, he could be tough. And he could whip you and, and drive you out of the temple. But his character and his nature is all of these things. Loving, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, kindness. And when you live like that, and you walk like that, then you're walking like Jesus. And you may not have noticed, or you may have noticed, if you, if you look back on your life, you know, when you, when you were a kid, what kind of a kid were you? Well, most of us were naughty in some way or another. Most of us did some things that we may regret or we shouldn't have done. That's just part and parcel of growing up. But we don't do those things anymore. So something has changed. What changed that? Well, it might just be growing up for some people. It might be because of some tragedies that came out of their, the events of their life that have changed them. Or it might be. And that's how it ought to be. That when they changed their minds about Jesus Christ, they began to change their lives. To live like Him. And the best and the happiest and the nicest and the ones, the, the kind of people that we like to be associated with are those who are loving and happy and at peace with you and with everybody else. They are long-suffering about our, the, the shortcomings of other people. They're kind, they're good, they're gentle. They're faithful and they're self-controlled because they look like Jesus now. And I'll tell you the best compliment that anybody could ever pay him is to say that he or she is like Jesus. But if they can't say that about us, what are they say? Because they want you. We may not think we have any influence over people, but people are watching us all of the time. And when they know we claim to be Christians, but we don't act like Christians act, or should act, they know that. Because they have a concept in their minds about what a Christian should act like. And when I don't act like that, that turns them away from the Lord. I'm not lifting up the Lord when I'm not glorifying him in the way in which I live. And actually that's what God wants from us. He wants us in our lives, in our behavior, in our thinking, in our words, in our actions, to lift up Jesus, exalt him in the eyes of people. 
as I said before, and as Professor said this morning, it's not to, and Rudy, not to exalt ourselves, but it's to exalt the Lord. But they don't see the Lord, they see you, and they see me. And if they don't see the Lord in us, we're not exalting Him, we're actually exalting something else. So, if I may conclude with these words, we didn't have anything to do specifically with raising, lifting Jesus up on the cross, except that our sins by extension are the reason why he was lifted up, because he was lifted up to die to forgive our sins. We didn't have anything to do with raising him up. We didn't have anything to do with his, with his ascension to heaven. That was all God's work. Our work is to lift him up now among the people that we associate with. When we lift him up, his promise is that I will lift you up. And there are many passages that relate to that. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. But I think the verse that gives me the most practical expression of that is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 from verse 11 to the end of the chapter, about verse 18. The Thessalonians were worried about what would happen to people who died. And so Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant. I just want you to know that those who have died in Christ, God will raise up, God will lift them up out of the grave and they will meet the Lord in the air when he comes and those of us that are still alive will be raised also after that to meet him in the Lord in the air and we will be forever with the Lord that's his promise he promises this in other ways in, in Matthew chapter 10 if you deny me I'll deny you but if you acknowledge me I'll acknowledge you before the throne of God so can you imagine when we come to stand before God and Jesus is there, is he going to be our defender or is he going to be our prosecutor? Is he going to tell the Lord, these people did not honour me, they did not lift me up, they did not glorify me in their life. Or, Father, these are the people that glorified me. These are the people that did what I wanted. You know the result of that. He's either going to say, come into my kingdom, prepared for you from the foundation of the earth, or he's going to say to you, depart from me, for I never knew you. The responsibility of lifting up Christ is in the hands of every single one of us. So my question that I'd like to leave you with today is, are you lifting up Christ by the way you live? Or are you lifting up something else and actually downgrading him and belittling him, the one you call your Saviour and your Lord and your God? And the way you answer that is the way your life will go for the rest of your life. And unfortunately, because of age, some of us don't have very well. Some of you do. But it's better for you to devote yourself, whether your life on this earth is short or long, to glorifying God. Because He will glorify you forever. And you'll never have to worry about it again. In eternity. But if we don't glorify Him in this life, hell and its condemnation is our God. Is our reward. From the Lord. So I beg you, think about whether you're lifting up the Lord in the way you live right now. And if you decide you're not, then change the way you live to conform to His way. And may God help you to do that. We're going to be singing this song, number 615, which is an invitation song. And I thought I would remember, but...
I'm going to hold up some of you and I don't always remember what the song says. We have heard the joyful song.